Hi everyone, this is Dr. Omar Chowdhury. Today I'll be talking to you about brain aneurysms. Um, I am a neurosurgeon um, with training in um, open vascular neurosurgery as well as endovascular uh, neurosurgery uh, with interventional neuroradiology. Today I will be talking about brain aneurysms and updates regarding management of patients who are diagnosed with brain aneurysms um, on a routine basis. So we'll start by talking about what exactly a brain aneurysm is. You can think of a brain aneurysm as being a blister, a bubble, or a balloon on a blood vessel inside the brain. These blood vessels are essentially pipes that are carrying normal blood in the brain, and uh, they're literally arborizing the brain tissue. And on this image, as you can see, this is a normal uh, brain blood vessel which branches out and then you have an aneurysm which is forming right at this branch point. And as you can see, this is almost like a balloon or a blister and has different parts to it. There is this aneurysm dome, which is the topmost bulging part. And then there is the neck, which is the start of the point of the aneurysm origin. Now, aneurysms are formed primarily because of turbulent blood flow uh, at the branch point of vessels. and this cartoon really shows well how an aneurysm is formed. Here you can see a normal blood vessel which branches out and then you can see the genesis or formation of a small aneurysm and how it grows over time and the direction of growth is really determined by the flow or the hemodynamic stress in the blood vessel. The brain blood vessels are essentially four major blood vessels that carry blood in the brain. There are these two carotid arteries, which are the large arteries you can feel your pulse from in the neck, as well as two arteries at the back of your neck, which are called vertebral arteries. Between these four blood vessels, every person gets the blood flow to their brain. And we often use the term anterior circulation and posterior circulation. The carotid arteries are the ones in the front, so they are considered anterior. And the vertebral arteries are at the back, so they are called posterior circulation blood vessels. This is another schematic that demonstrates the carotid artery here in a patient on the left side. This is the carotid artery on the right side. And you can see at the back of the head, there are these arteries, the vertebral arteries, which join to form the basilar artery. Now, it's important to know that these arteries in the brain essentially start off at the level of the heart and then they divide, they go up the neck, and ultimately end up in the brain. So the location or where exactly the aneurysm is forming along this course is very important because that determines what exactly it means in terms of its repercussions if it bleeds. These blood vessels, as mentioned, are very closely associated with the brain, and they travel in a special space, which is called the subarachnoid space. This is a... Um, section of the brain um, um, in a human that demonstrates all these blood vessels, the arteries of the red colored, and as you can see, they're very closely associated with all the, the depths and grooves within the brain surface. And um, this picture shows how the blood vessel is traveling, for example, from the neck at the base of the skull is passing through bone and ultimately it enters the spaces, which is called the subarachnoid space which is an open space filled with spinal fluid, um, and it has these trabeculations, which are spider-like. That's where the, the name, the arachnoid, comes from, um, and that's where these blood vessels travel. And this is another picture that shows how all these blood vessels at the base of the brain are located, and you can see the carotid arteries in the front and the posterior circulation blood vessels in the back. This is important to know because if there's a problem in these blood vessels, if there's an aneurysm that bleeds, it bleeds within this space. And that's why the condition is called a subarachnoid hemorrhage when these aneurysms bleed. Aneurysms can have different shapes. The most common kind of aneurysm, the one that patients see me for and we often have to treat, are the ones we call as saccular aneurysms. They essentially, like we described before, look like a balloon or a blister on a blood vessel. And they have a dome and they have a neck as described before. The fusiform aneurysms are more circumferentially enlarged. And, um, you know, we often give an analogy of a, a snake who's eaten an egg, so it's like dilated on all sides. And the third kind of aneurysm is some, something which is very different, which is called a dissecting aneurysm. Now, this aneurysm does look like a fusiform aneurysm, 
but it forms because of damage to the inside wall or the lining of the blood vessel that leads to the blood trickling from the inside of the blood vessel to within the wall of the blood vessel that leads to it being dilated. Um, so it, again, it's important to know how aneurysms can come in different shapes, but again, the most common form is the saccular aneurysm here. I often get asked the question uh, by patients with aneurysm like, why do I have an aneurysm and what caused my aneurysm? The fact is that, you know, some people are born with aneurysms, but that's definitely the minority because the aneurysms are, are uncommon in children. Um, however, most of the aneurysms are sporadic or acquired over time as we age, as there's hemodynamic stress on the blood vessels and patients who have high blood pressure or smoking. And then some people are just more predisposed to having brain aneurysms because of their genetics. There are some syndromes that we know about in people who have polycystic kidney disease or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome where there can be defects in the blood vessel wall with the muscle formation or the elastin uh, uh, within the wall uh, that can lead to these defects that puts people more prone for forming aneurysms and also in Marfan syndrome. Uh, but again, it's a combination of things, but the most common subtype is sporadic. And you can see that the aneurysms, like I said, can come in different shapes. So this is these are two examples of saccular aneurysms where you can see a sac and there's a dome of the aneurysm, there's a neck, and then there are these type of saccular aneurysms which you have neck which is equal to the dome. So they're very wide-based aneurysms. So this is called a narrow-necked aneurysm, and this is something that's called a wide-based aneurysm. I often see a lot of patients where um, they get referred to me because they underwent a study that showed a brain aneurysm, but often they don't really have an aneurysm. So um, we often take the credit for giving them the good news because there are some other conditions that can be confused with brain aneurysms, and one of those conditions is called an infundibulum. Now, infundibulum is essentially, it looks like an aneurysm, it looks like a pouch as in this picture, but there's always a blood vessel coming out of the top of the dome. Infundibulums are very safe lesions. They don't rupture. They really don't need to be monitored or undergo surveillance imaging. So it's actually a really good news in someone who was told that they have an aneurysm, but it turns out that they have an infundibulum. And often we need to do more accurate tests, as we will talk about in later slides, to diagnose that. Similarly, in some people, they can have more dilated blood vessels, which are just a little more full than the other blood vessels. Often we use a term called delicoectasia, which again, could not possibly be real aneurysms. And finally, there could be these anomalies in blood vessels where there could be these two connections at certain sites, which are called fenestrations, that can often be misconstrued as aneurysms on a certain non-invasive imaging like MR angiograms. So it's really important to know when someone gets told that they have an aneurysm, if it's really a true aneurysm, and if it's something that's worrisome for bleeding in the future, and if it needs treatment. Aneurysms, like I said, can come in different shapes, but they can also come in different sizes. I've taken care of aneurysms as small as one millimeter, uh, which often don't need treatment. And as you can see in this patient MR angiogram, you can see this very tiny dot, which is a one to two millimeter aneurysm right here. And at the same time, the aneurysms can be as large as four centimeters. And this is an example of that where you can see a large bulging sac full of blood at the base of the brain in this patient, which is one of the largest aneurysms that we've treated. So they can come in different sizes. They could be small to large to giant. And usually around two and a half centimeters is what we consider as a giant aneurysm if it's bigger than that. Similarly, like we talked about, aneurysms can be of different shapes. They can be of different sizes. And at the same time, they can happen in different blood vessels of the brain. So we alluded a little bit to the blood vessels in the front of the head, which are the carotid arteries and the anterior cerebral arteries, the middle cerebral arteries. If the aneurysms form here, they're considered anterior circulation. And if the aneurysms form at the back of the head, they're considered posterior circulation aneurysms. And just for trivia, the most common location for aneurysm is the one in the front of the head, which is called anterior communicating artery aneurysms. 
The second most common are the posterior communicating artery aneurysms right here. And these are the ones that more often happen in females. Brain aneurysm really has a significant disease burden in our population. It's one of those conditions that people may not know they have a brain aneurysm until it bleeds. The fact is that around 2% of the population walks around with brain aneurysms, which is considered like 1 in 50 uh, in the population. Some autopsy studies have shown a higher prevalence, up to 5%, but the 2% is generally accepted prevalence in terms of how many people in the population usually have brain aneurysms. And the fact is that the aneurysms rupture fairly frequently um, every 18 minutes. 30,000 people in the United States suffer a brain aneurysm rupture every year. 20% of the people often have more than one aneurysm. Uh, we've had patients up to five to six aneurysms inside their brain. And similarly, ruptured brain aneurysms have a huge morbidity and mortality toll. So if you look at these numbers, you may think that, oh, okay, it's one to two percent of the population, but if someone has brain aneurysms, the repercussions are huge because it's fatal in 40% of the cases. The 66% uh, survivors, they can have permanent neurologic damage. So essentially we're looking at only almost 20 to 30% of people with ruptured brain aneurysms who make a completely full recovery. Out of all the people who are diagnosed with uh, ruptured brain aneurysms, only 10% of those people have had someone in their family with brain aneurysms. And that tells you that the genetics have only a part to play in how these aneurysms are formed and your environment, like high blood pressure and smoking, um, have a very important role in the genesis of brain aneurysms. As we all know, and this is something that, you know, catches news every now and then, is like, why are brain aneurysms important? And why does it raise a red flag when someone's a scan done for other reasons demonstrates a brain aneurysm. The reason is because brain aneurysms can burst and bleed, and they can cause the condition that I discussed before called subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is essentially spilling of blood all over the brain in this uh, subarachnoid space, which is normally occupied by spinal fluid. Um, when the aneurysms burst and bleed, it's usually the worst headache of life for that particular person. You know, it's, it's very interesting, like whenever you have a patient with a ruptured aneurysm and if you ask them, was this really the worst headache of your life? Invariably, no doubt, patients with ruptured brain aneurysms always answer yes. So it's, uh, it's a very different uh, pounding or what they describe as a thunderclap headache. Um, these patients are essentially very sick. They can have nausea, vomiting. If once the aneurysm bursts, it's uh, pushing on an important nerve that controls the eye, it can lead to double vision. Some people can have a seizure. Some people can have such a bad hemorrhage uh, from the aneurysm rupture that they can be in coma. And some people just don't survive as we will look at some of these numbers in the coming slides. Um, so as you can see, like I alluded before, almost 15 to 30% of patients that die before they reach the hospital, 17 to 30% that survive to the hospital, but they die within 24 hours. Uh, so the total early mortality of a ruptured brain aneurysm is up to 60%. And um, as I mentioned uh, in the prior slide, there's a large number of survivors who are left with brain injury and are not able to go back to their jobs or function the same way. This is a diagram that demonstrates how an aneurysm that we had discussed forms is now ruptured. As you can see, it's usually at a point of weakness that the aneurysm bursts and the blood escapes the aneurysm dome and goes out into the subarachnoid space and spills around the brain. And when these people have this bleeding, this is what it looks like. These are autopsy specimens where you can see all the blood around the brain. It's filling all the subarachnoid space, which is the potential space. And this patient was found to have this aneurysm, uh, which caused the initial bleeding. And this is an actual patient um, uh, who is undergoing surgery for ruptured brain aneurysm. And you can see that the whole brain is stained with blood uh, because of the spilling of this blood around the brain. Uh, these people uh, with ruptured brain aneurysms, when they get a CAT scan of the head, um, you can see that this is a normal CAT scan. And when they have subarachnoid hemorrhage from a ruptured brain aneurysm, they have this white 
spilling of blood, which shows up very nicely on a non-contrast uh, head scans, is just filling the spaces, the subarachnoid space around the brain. And often, uh, if it's in a localized area, it can also push on the brain fairly significantly. The core of this talk essentially is going to be talking about aneurysms before they burst, because that makes up a major part of my practice as a cerebrovascular and skull based surgeon, where I see people who were diagnosed to have aneurysms which haven't yet burst. And these aneurysms are found when um, someone has a headache, or they were involved in a motor vehicle accident, or they had a family member who had an aneurysm and they just decided to have themselves checked out, or for some other unrelated reasons. Um, and uh, the fact is that most of the unruptured aneurysms are asymptomatic. So most of the people who have brain aneurysms, they really don't have any symptoms from it. And those are those 2% people that we talked about. They're just walking around with brain aneurysms. And they often don't know about it until these aneurysms break and bleed. These aneurysms, uh, before they uh, bleed, sometimes can cause headaches and uh, Often that's the reason why often people get scanned. And um, I often have this question asked by patients when they see me for an incidental, maybe like a three millimeter brain aneurysm, um, and they have had a history of headache, and they often ask me, is my headache because of my aneurysm? And the answer is usually no, because most of the aneurysms, when they're small, they generally do not cause headaches. Um, and only when they become large enough and start pushing on the brain membranes, that's when they can cause headaches. And another explanation that I tell pa my patients is that headaches are a lot more common than brain aneurysms. So usually, uh, often patients have a history of migraine or tension headaches, which could be the underlying reason. But in some cases, when the aneurysms do get large enough, uh, they can cause headaches. And often pain behind the eye, if that's where the aneurysms are located, is important uh, to know. Uh, when the aneurysms become large enough and start pushing on important parts of the brain, they can cause weakness or numbness or double vision if it's one of the cranial nerves. Often in right-handed people who have their speech centers on the left side of the brain, a left-sided aneurysm which is large enough can um, cause uh, small strokes or speech problems from the aneurysm. So uh, unruptured brain aneurysms, while most are asymptomatic, in certain scenarios they can cause some problems which leads to their diagnosis. This slide essentially shows the most common tests that are completed uh, for people for diagnosis of their brain aneurysms. These tests include a CT angiogram, an MR angiogram, and a cerebral angiogram. Now the most common test in someone who has suspicion of a brain aneurysm that is ordered to have a test done by the primary care physician, by the neurologist, is usually an MR angiogram. And that's kind of what the picture looks like over here. Uh, the reason why it's a good test is because it's really non-invasive. You have to lay in an MR scanner. You don't really need a contrast dye for it. And it's a very quick test that shows you if there's an aneurysm. A CT angiogram is a CAT scan in which you are given a contrast dye, usually an iodinated contrast to your IV, and you get a picture something like this. So you get a lot better resolution than an MRI, but again, there's exposure to radiation, uh, but the quality of images is, is slightly better than an MRA. A cerebral angiogram is something that is commonly used as a definitive test or a gold standard uh, for looking at brain aneurysms, and this is kind of what it looks like. And it's very interesting that this is actually a technique which has been there uh, for a longer period than a CAT scan and an MRI, because uh, it's just essentially x-rays which are subtracting the patient's bone just to look at the blood vessels. And that's why it's called a digital subtraction angiography. Now, since around 2000, mid-2000s, uh, we've been having this technique called 3D angiography, uh, which makes the picture look something like this, which is essentially the best image you can get for a brain aneurysm because it can show you the surface of the brain aneurysm, any irregularities, um, and can give you a beautiful picture that helps you assess uh, what the features of the aneurysm are. So like I mentioned, a, a CAT scan is something that is fast, has good resolution, is up to 98% sensitive for brain aneurysms. It essentially involves using radiation in the CAT scanner, which is very, very uh, small amount of radiation exposure.
Um, similarly, an MRA is usually the, the most popular test for screening for aneurysms. Um, it is almost up to 97% sensitive with improving techniques and doesn't really need any contrast. I will take a few minutes to talk about cerebral angiography because that's essentially is the gold standard for aneurysm imaging. It's the best test available for looking at brain aneurysms and it involves having the patient come to a biplane neuroangiography suite where they lay on the table and we essentially um, place a catheter or a plastic tubing inside their blood vessels and the two most common routes for doing and geography are going through the groin, through the femoral artery, or going through the wrist, through the radial artery. And um, once we enter these blood vessels, we put a catheter, which is a plastic tubing, all the way up to their neck, and we inject contrast, and we take very uh, nice x-ray pictures um, to um, make some decisions. Um, angiography is really the best tool for determining whether an aneurysm needs a treatment and what kind of treatment is best for a certain aneurysm. Um, also knowing about the aneurysm morphology, size, and location. It's an outpatient procedure. So someone who is getting a cerebral angiogram comes in the morning of um, almost 90 to 95 percent of the cerebral angiograms that I do here in my um, uh, practice are done from the radial route. Uh, from the from the wrist and the patients are able to go home within an hour or two after their procedure and the procedure length is usually around 30 minutes. This is kind of what the patients have to expect. Uh, we usually go in from the distal radial artery. This part is called the anatomical snuff box and if the radial artery is big enough, which is it is in most patients, we're able to get these pictures uh, looking at these blood vessels from the front, from the side, and also we're able to get the 3D angiogram that we talked about. It's a safe procedure, and uh, that's why we use it fairly frequently, because the risks are really one in 1,000 or one in 10,000 of having things such as minimal bleeding, small risk of infection, and a very tiny risk of stroke. So it's a very safe procedure. It's done as an outpatient, and allows the maximal resolution for a brain aneurysm for making important decisions. We come to the main question, uh, which is the underlying theme for this talk on aneurysms, is that once someone gets diagnosed with a brain aneurysm, how do we know if it will ever rupture? Because almost 50 to 70 percent of the aneurysms that got diagnosed, they may not ever rupture. So th making decisions for treatment of an unruptured brain aneurysm in a patient is is fairly complex because we have to consider a lot of different things. So it's almost like fortune telling or looking into the future and predicting if an aneurysm is ever going to rupture. And if you knew with certainty that this aneurysm is going to burst five or ten years from now, then the answer would be easy to go ahead and treat it. But again, we can only predict and we do that by looking at our data and giving them a percentage risk of the aneurysm bursting during their patient's uh, lifetime, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is probably the key slide of this webinar because it essentially lists all the things that we know about um, that are factors known to promote aneurysm rupture. Now, as we talked about before, size of the aneurysm is important. Larger the aneurysm, the higher the likelihood of its bursting. Certain aneurysms are considered a high-risk location, and these include the anterior communicating artery aneurysms, the posterior communicating artery aneurysms, and the posterior circulation aneurysms like basilar artery aneurysms and vertebral artery aneurysms. People who have high blood pressure are at a higher risk of aneurysm rupture. Patients with an age more than 70 years are at a higher risk of aneurysm rupture. In someone who has had multiple aneurysms, having one aneurysm burst can put the other aneurysms at a higher risk of bursting. Some studies have shown that people from Japan and Finland and from the African American populations have a higher risk of aneurysm rupture. Aneurysm morphology is a very important factor because aneurysms that are irregular or have a daughter sac or have multiple lobes to it, as we will see in some pictures, are more risky compared to aneurysms that have smoother walls. People who have multiple aneurysms are at a high risk of aneurysm bursting 
in someone who has a single aneurysm, family history of someone who has had one or two first-degree relatives with a ruptured brain aneurysm, their risk of aneurysm bursting goes high as well. A history of smoking, a history of alcohol use, and drugs that can increase your blood pressure, like cocaine, which are sympathomimetic drugs, can really put patients at a high risk of aneurysm rupture. So these are all the things that we have to keep into consideration when we have someone with an unruptured brain aneurysm in assessing their risk profile and recommending watching an aneurysm versus recommending treatment. The aneurysm size is a very interesting topic because as we talked about the smaller aneurysms that are at lower risk of rupture and a higher size aneurysms, a bigger aneurysm is, a, is at a higher risk of rupture. But there have been a lot of studies, and one of the studies was this international study on unruptured intracranial aneurysms, which was published in 98, and then the follow-up in 2003, that came up with this number of seven millimeters as really the cutoff where the aneurysms have a lower versus a higher risk of rupture. But as we know that this is not really true, as has been shown by subsequent studies, in fact, one of these studies, uh, which was published in 2018, shows that more than 75% of the aneurysms that present as ruptured are less than seven to 10 millimeters. And this is the graph that essentially shows over the years between 91 to 2016, how the percentage of aneurysms that are zero to five millimeters almost make up 50% of all ruptured aneurysms at this particular center. Aneurysm location, like we mentioned before, are high risk, like the aneurysms in the anterior communicating artery, the posterior communicating artery, and the posterior circulation, which is important to consider. The aneurysm morphology is important. We'll spend a few seconds on this. The surface irregularity. As you can see on this 3D angiogram, um, in this uh, patient who has a large aneurysm which measures around 10 millimeters, also has these small lobulations or daughter sacs. Now these features are really key in putting an aneurysm at a high risk for rupture. So whenever we see this, we usually quantify that patient as having a higher risk of rupture versus someone who has a smooth wall with no daughter sacs something called aspect ratio, an aneurysm in which looks more like a sock, which is longer, has a higher risk of bursting than aneurysm that is rounded or it does not have that much of depth to it. And similarly, calcification is important whenever we see whether or not there's a lot of calcium in the wall in terms of deciding the, the method of treatment. A few words about the International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms. Though a not a perfect study, it was a study in which a large number of patients with unruptured aneurysms uh, were studied. And this is essentially what they found. This is uh, from 2013. Uh, where we found that patients uh, with less than seven millimeter aneurysms in these uh, patients essentially had up to zero uh, percent risk of rupture. The second column is for people who've already had a prior aneurysm rupture. This number was very surprising because uh, all cerebrovascular surgeons know that day in and day out we treat ruptured aneurysms anywhere from three to five millimeters in size. So this number is not really true, uh, but for the longest time, this was the best data available and was used to decide and recommend treatment of aneurysm. So in 2003, if a patient came to the office with a seven uh, or a six millimeter anterior communicating artery aneurysm, the patient would likely have been told to have another scan in six months to see if the aneurysm is growing. And that's really changed over the years because of further studies that have come. The other thing that the study showed was the location. So it was the first study to show that the aneurysms at the back of the head were at a higher risk of rupture. Um, there was a more recent study published in 2012 amongst the Japanese population, which was the first study to show that the aneurysms in the front of the head or the anterior communicating artery aneurysms are at a much higher risk and they found ruptured aneurysms within the five to six millimeter range as well. And this was also the first study that actually showed that aneurysms that are irregular or have a daughter sac like I showed you in prior pictures are more risky than aneurysms that have a more smoother wall. 
One of the tools that's available in really giving the patients with unruptured brain aneurysms a number to think about for the lifetime risk of aneurysm rupture is a FACES scoring system. Now, this is not perfect, but this is one of the scoring systems which we have to have a discussion regarding uh, what's the risk of an aneurysm bursting during a patient's lifetime. And it essentially looks at where the people come from. If they're Japanese and Finnish, it gives them a higher risk. And this scoring system comes from pooling all the studies that I just showed you. It looks at high blood pressure, which gives them a point, age above 70. Their size above seven millimeters gives them a point because of the data from the prior study. And the location, people with aneurysms at the back of the head and anterior communicating artery uh, get a point. And then we add up these scores and see what the risk of rupture of the aneurysm is. Now, the reason why I say that this is not a perfect scoring system is because someone who has a FACES score of five has a five-year risk of aneurysm rupture at 1.3%. And if they have 20 years to live, they essentially have a lifetime risk of 4%. But what the scoring system does not keep into consideration if someone has a family history, because there's no weightage given to that because we don't have great data to put that in the scoring system. It does not give any points to smoking, people who have multiple aneurysms, and does not look at irregular aneurysms with irregular morphology, uh, like I discussed before. So again, it's a good starting point for giving patients a risk for aneurysm rupture, but it's usually a much more conservative number than the reality, especially if patients have a family history, they're smokers, if they have an irregular aneurysms or if they have multiple aneurysms. But again, I do use this in my practice to guide some discussions, um, especially uh, to make the conversation more objective and data-driven. Family history is important, especially in people with two or more first-degree relatives. And I have a lot of young patients with kids, and they're like, I was found to have a ruptured aneurysm. Do I need to have my kids checked out? And the fact is that they have to be two or more first-degree relatives uh, to make screening high yield based on data. Um, so that's important to know. So this is an important slide because that tells you essentially as a neurosurgeon who deals with brain aneurysms has to play a balancing act. And the balancing act is in terms of before recommending someone a management strategy for their aneurysms, I'm balancing what's the natural history or rupture risk of an aneurysm by looking at all those things we talked about and balancing that with the risks of treatment. And that's something that me as a surgeon who treats endovascular aneurysms as well as open surgical aneurysms can weigh and recommend patients treatment versus not. And then often if they're equal, if the rupture risk is equal to the treatment risk, then it's really not an easy situation to make decisions. And at that point, I really have a deep discussion with the patient and their family and talk about how much having an aneurysm and the repercussions affects their day-to-day -day living, their functionality, if that has an anxiety component, and if they're okay with living their life knowing a very small percentage risk of this aneurysm bursting. And that's what drives the treatment in that scenario. So this brings me towards the tail end of this webinar, and I hope this gave a sense to all the viewers about the fact that aneurysms are really complex lesions, and they really need to be managed on an individualized basis, and they have a very high mortality or death once they bleed. Once they are diagnosed, they can be treated safely, and all the things we talked about between minimally invasive treatment, more than 70% of the aneurysms can be treated that way endovascularly. Some aneurysms need open surgery and clipping. And the fact is that aneurysm treatment has to be individualized for every patient depending on multiple aneurysm factors and patient factors. And that's where what I call is personalized aneurysm care. Not every aneurysm needs treatment. It's only warranted if the rupture risk of the aneurysm during a patient's lifetime is higher than the treatment risk. And the aneurysm management should really be sought at specialized cerebrovascular centers 
uh, with aneurysm experts. We here at Penn Medicine and the Cerebrovascular Center are neurosurgeons and interventional radiologists um, work as a multidisciplinary group for treatment of brain aneurysms. My uh, neurosurgical service uh, manages patients in this multidisciplinary fashion with both open surgery and endovascularly, depending on what is the best treatment route for patients. There is uh, a neuroscience blog that we published uh, earlier this year which talks about basic questions regarding brain aneurysms, which is, comes in very handy uh, when talking about brain aneurysms for someone who's just been diagnosed. Penn Cerebral Vascular Center is uh, equipped with offering all the latest treatment options and uh, really having discussions with patients regarding what having a brain aneurysm means and uh, what's the risk of a rupture. We also have a brain aneurysm support group, uh, which is uh, including patients who've had prior brain aneurysms treated, both ruptured and unruptured, who can share experiences with patients. Feel free to reach out to me and my department um, regarding um, management of your brain aneurysm and cerebrovascular conditions, and we would be glad to um, have you in and uh, answer your questions and uh, uh, manage your care. Um, I would also encourage uh, if someone needs a second opinion regarding their brain aneurysms, it's highly recommended. Uh, thank you.